today we hear about the healing of the gathering demoniac and it's always perplexed me the response of the people to seeing this miracle because here was a man who was clearly well at maybe best a nuisance maybe even more than that since it says they kept him under guard and locked up and tied up in, in, in chains and you would think that after they see that he has been restored to his right mind, that the demons have been cast out of him, that they'd be relieved at the sight of this healing. But it says in the Gospels, rather, that they are extremely afraid and they ask Jesus to leave them. This is just too much. You have to get out of here. And we see in the Scriptures that we have this this sort of a complicated relationship with fear talks about fear in this complicated way. And when you read the scriptures, we discover that not all fear is equal. Because in this case, because of their fear, the people send the Savior away. But we also learn in the book of Proverbs that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So not all fear is the same. The people in the gospel, the engine that was driving their fear was self-preservation. They had encountered something unknown. And we don't like things that are unknown. There's this very ancient part of our brain that is always working on threat assessment. And we are always much quicker. Our default setting is to go to the negative before the positive. And when we see something new, we will first usually see it as a threat. So they encounter this thing that they didn't expect, and they see it as a threat, and they ask Jesus to leave because their fear was driven by self-preservation. It's the same thing that happens all the way back in the book of Genesis after Adam and Eve partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says that then they hid from God because they were afraid. Because they realized that they had transgressed his one, com his one commandment. That's it. And they transgressed it and out of self-preservation they were afraid and they hid from God. So what we know in the scriptures about any fear that is driven by self-preservation, particularly when it comes to our relationship with God, is that kind of fear snuffs life out. In Matthew 16, 25, Jesus says that whoever would save his life will lose it. That when all we are concerned about is threat assessment and just preserving our life, preserving our little corner of the world, if that's what drives us, if we're motivated by fear of losing that, we are guaranteed of, of having the very thing that we're afraid of happen. Whoever is that would save his life, is obsessed with that, will lose it. But there's also a life-giving fear. And that is something quite different. That is motivated by a, quite a different engine. Because life-giving fear is not driven by the desire for self-preservation. Life-giving fear, as it is written about in the scriptures, is driven by humility. It is having enough humility to realize how broken we are, how sinful we are, and to realize that our obsessions, compulsions, and addictions always have the possibility of drawing us off the rails. That there's always the possibility, if we are not careful, and this life-giving fear should motivate us to stay vigilant. 
Because even after you've accepted Christ and been in the church and, and, and involved in the life of the church, the sacraments for years and years and years, the old nature still wants to take over. Especially when we get tired or angry or lonely. Especially in moments of weakness. The old nature wants to take over. We must always be vigilant. And so when we talk about the fear of God, this is what we're talking about. The awareness that it is always possible for me to go off the rails. And I need to stay vigilant. In the 3rd century, Clement of Alexandria wrote, We do not actually fear God himself. We fear falling away from God. In the 6th century, St. Dorotheus of Gaza, and yes, that Gaza, there have been Christians in Gaza, that law. St. Dorotheus of Gaza said, A godly man fears and keeps God's will, not for fear of punishment, not to avoid condemnation, but because he has tasted the sweetness of being with God, and he fears that he may fall away from it. He fears to be turned from it. And in the ninth century, St. Theodorus the Great wrote, the greater our longing for God, the greater grows our fear. Nothing is more terrible than this great fear of losing Him. We are not afraid of God. We are afraid of losing God. Because in our humility, we know that if we are not careful, we will trip up. Several years ago, in our summer reading group, we read the book Mountain of Silence by Kiriakos Macrides. And in that book, Macrides frames it this way. The fear of God of the saints refers to the fear of losing their connection with God, the divine lover, and not the fear of a patriarchal despot that rules over the universe with an iron fist. A life-giving fear of God is one that does not motivate us to hide from God, but to always keep the eyes of our heart focused on Him. Life-giving fear is not a barrier, it is a motivator. And we use the awareness of our sin, of our brokenness, to compel us to run to Christ, just like Legion ran to Christ, in today's Gospel reading. The Fathers teach us that we should never think of our sin without at the same time being mindful of the steadfast love of God. And the awareness of our sins then becomes not something that paralyzes us, but something that drives us forward. Our fear is always mingled by hope and the knowledge of God's steadfast love and mercy. And we are vigilant. And when we fall, we get up again. Because we know that healing and forgiveness will always be there for those who seek it. That's the life-giving fear of God. Not being afraid of a tyrant. So being afraid of losing our connection with the one who is our fear, Mahalalah. That fear keeps us vigilant. And that fear keeps us focused. And that focus gives us life. Now and ever. And to the ages of ages. Amen.